Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sir, how are you? May it please the court. My name is Scott Boggs and I'm with the Boggs Law Group here representing the appellants, Mr. and Mrs. Aprahamian. <clears throat> we are here today on the appeal of a summary judgment entered against our clients, Simone and Aswan Aprahamian. The case involves a denied claim under Aprahamian's homeowner's insurance policy uh, in the insurer's citizens. So the Abrahamians have a home. Uh, it is a property that they rent, that they've employed a property manager with. And what's unusual about this home is that the first story of this two-story home that's near the water is encased in stone. It's a stone facade. Now, it goes back some 50 years. It's not a thin facade. It's a very heavy, thick facade. And so they noticed that there were issues regarding uh, cracking in that facade and also issues with the back deck. And they made a claim with Citizens, and Citizens has denied that claim. We are here to say that there is coverage in their policy under the provision additional coverage collapse, and that that additional coverage provides them with coverage for the damage that they have had at their property. So why, why did the trial court rule against you? Well, the trial court granted the summary judgment motion. The, the first motion that uh, was brought in this case, first motion for summary judgment was denied. And then a month later in May, the Florida Supreme Court came out with a new amended rule for summary judgment. Uh, defendants then put forward a second motion for summary judgment, and that order was granted. I believe that was an error based on the new amended rule. And uh, the heart of the issue, I think, is evidence. So the Florida Supreme Court has come out with a decision or an explanation of the amended rule and in how it applies to us, what was different between the unamended rule and the amended rule. Uh, is really evidence. So, well, but it could also be an absence thereof, which the judge mentions twice in his order. He says the jury cannot find a very proponent because the evidence presented in the court establishes a complete absence of evidence that a collapse actually occurred. Yeah, I think that's an error. I, I mean, uh, we cite. Why don't you tell, tell me your best evidence that supports your argument that, it, that this was a collapse? Because apparently the judge, when you read the whole record, says, I, don't, I can't find any evidence of it. Yeah, well, we have two, two witnesses. One is the original. There's no witnesses that actually saw it happen. Yeah, but in first party property damage, we rarely have an eyewitness. I think that the court, for some reason, fell into a mode of saying we must have an eyewitness account. But the, the, the policy requires an abrupt collapse. Uh, the policy, if you look at what we provided in Kings Ridge, all right, Kings Ridge is a, is a policy language almost identical to ours. Kings Ridge, there was a deflection of the roof trusses of 12 inches. And because of the way the policy is written, the court in Kings Ridge said that there is uh, ambiguity in the policy that must be most, it must be interpreted in favor of the insured. If I remember King's Roof, that's the one where the roof fell like a foot or two. And yeah, it fell 12 inches. And in that case, they cite three other instances where there was property damage and there was no complete or abrupt collapse. So King Ridge is gonna say that our definition of collapse is a legal definition, is not an abrupt falling down. It's gonna say that some part of the building must have failed. But it's not even necessary for it to fall to the ground. Well, I wasn't suggesting that, but it, you know, an abrupt collapse would be would encompass a twelve-inch deflection. Yeah, well, we had an actual beam fall to the ground. That's the matter is going back to Judge Black's point. Nobody saw what happened. No, no one testified that. Yeah, we were doing this renovation, and bang, this beam come down. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we rarely ever have an eyewitness event of property damage. We have all sorts of hurricane cases, and we don't have 
parties that are there when the hurricane hits or we have roof damage from a hailstorm. We don't have someone standing on the roof. We have evidence. We have evidence from an engineer. It says that he examined that uh, particular beam and it had so deteriorated, he was thought that the people that lived there were in danger. And it's that very beam that fell to the ground. We have a property manager who was very involved with that property, right? He had been there for six years, taking photos and making reports. And he said, that's the beam that fell. Now he didn't, well, he wasn't the actual eyewitness that saw the beam. Did he get information from a third party? Like he, he relied upon both what the engineer had said and also upon what the contractor had said and his own experience of examining the property over and over and over. So somehow the lower court was saying, you have to have an eyewitness, right? Well, there's all sorts of evidence that is good evidence that may not be eyewitness evidence, uh, Judge LaRose. I think the jury should have the ability to hear our witness, our engineer, uh, the property manager, to see the photographs that were taken, to talk about their impressions of what they saw, what they experienced. That's good evidence. That's real evidence. Well, we know, let's, let's take what you're saying. We know that the beam fell. Yes, sir. We know that it had some rot, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we know it fell in connection or during the time of the renovation. Yes, and we don't know if it abruptly collapsed because you don't have direct evidence of it abruptly collapse. Well, because of the requirements of the policy and additional coverage collapse, all right, there has to be one of the, there are six subsets of what could be, right? We're claiming number two and number six. Number two is saying if it's called by hidden decay, all right? That requirement in itself prevents anybody from having an eyewitness to what took place, right? Because the decay must be hidden. It's like if we have a pipe bust in the wall, did someone see the pipe bust in the wall? Well, no, we, we didn't see it. There was no eyewitness. There was a storm and there's hell damage on your roof. Was anybody on the roof to saw and actually see the damage to the property? Well, no, but that, you know, we didn't see it, right? But we know that the event took place and we have the examination of professionals. Well, we know we know in a hail situation, we know that because we typically will have evidence that there was a hail storm that went through the area at such and such a time. We're going to have someone who's going to testify that, oh, I can see the markings and the damage caused by the hail. All I know here is that the beam's on the ground. Well, we also have the examination by the engineer who looked at the beam and said uh, that he thought it was in the process of failing, before it failed. So, and uh, there was concern, you know, he had communicated to the property manager concern that someone might get hurt. And shoring had to be taken up because of his concern about the structural deficiencies of that beam. And the beam ends up on the ground. We have the property manager saying, that we hired a contractor and his sole duty was to remove the stone facade. He was not to remove any beams, any structural issues. And so, so just, just structural, like the, the beam is, is made of wood. The beam is made of metal. It's made of metal. Yes. Okay. And it's then on the, the pillars? Yes. Is there a rebar in those pillars? No, sir. Okay. So just, yeah, the concern is where it was joined, plates were joined to the vertical supports. And so that had been hidden, right? Because it's covered with this stone facade. We have a lot of testimony about you not being able to see behind it, right? right? So no, we can't say this is exactly when that beam failed, but that's the nature of deterioration, right? It, it's procedural, it takes a it process. Where, where is this? I recall that there's some discussion about rust. Yeah, we think that that's a red herring, uh, Judge LaRose. Corrosion is an exclusion in the main body of the policy. Now, we have what's called additional coverage collapse. Now, in Kings Ridge, uh, they talk about this very issue. I don't want to talk about the case, but I want to talk about what's the rust of corrosion on any portion. Yes. On me. Yes. And corrosion. 
corrosion include rust? Rust is a type of corrosion. Yeah, and I think corrosion is a type of decay. Okay. So I think the overarching term used for this kind of deterioration is decay. And then we have specific subsets of description of what kind of decay is it corrosion, right? Is it rot or, you know. Okay. I'm sorry, Judge Black, we, did we answer your question? Yeah. I did, okay. So the issues that we have here, so we do believe that we have evidence. We certainly have disputed facts. They certainly uh, are substantial and we have evidence to the two issues I think at hand. One is collapse. In Kings Ridge, we're told that we don't have to have an abrupt falling down to the ground. And one case, there was a floor. Kings Ridge cites three cases of property damage. One of those says, well, this floor fell one inch to 17 inches, right? There was some structural failure. An engineering term that, that is used is to fail, right? Material failure. We talk about things breaking. They talk about it failing. So in Kings Ridge, you had a ceiling attached to these trusses and these trusses then supported a roof. And once those trusses deflected 12 inches, the ceiling deflected and the roof deflected. So in our particular situation, we have almost identical policy language and we have this additional coverage collapse. Now in Kings Ridge, they're gonna say, that the exclusions in the main body of the policy cannot apply to the additional coverage section or it would nullify the additional coverage. That these exclusions, so uh, appellees have talked about corrosion being an exclusion. They wanna paint it as you know, something that negates coverage. But by offering additional coverage collapse, that is insulated from the qualification of these exclusions in the main policy. We find that in Kings Ridge, it's, it's laid out very specifically. So, can I ask you a question? You're arguing a sudden collapse, correct? We're arguing a, su a sudden collapse occurred? No, we are saying that according to Kings Ridge definition of collapse, we have had collapse. So why was there a 30 day delay between the occurrence and the reporting to the insurance company? Uh, I don't know. I know that um, we have a property manager that's on site and he has to communicate what he finds to an out-of-state owner, right, who had, I think, taken a position in New York and was actually living in New York State. And so I think by the time of getting the information, communicating it, having it thought about it, recontacting it probably took 30 days. I made a big deal about that, Colo. No one, I'm sorry, sir. No, no one made a big deal about the delay below? No, not that I'm aware of. So, in regards uh, to collapse, uh, we have met the definition under Kings Ridge of a collapse. We have a collapse, right? And the number two, it says, well, if it's uh, in that provision and the policy language, it requires hidden decay. Well, our, you know, our engineer has said, yeah, it's, it's decay. Now, in his deposition, opposing counsel had used the word corrosion over and over and over and over because that's what they were trying to set up. At the end of the, his testimony, I said, what is the distinction between decay and corrosion? And he said, in my, his mind, none. They were interchangeable. They were simultaneous. And I asked, is there, is there some engineering form uh, or standard definition for corrosion or decay? And he said, no. So everything that he talked about in his testimony, about all the corrosion that he saw. Here's my last question. The trial court said there was no covered loss on the policy language, correct? Yes. Did the trial court elaborate on the factual basis for that statement? No, sir. They seem to they, they seem to say that we lacked eyewitness testimony, eyewitness evidence, and certainly that's not the standard, right? The standard that we look for in witness or in evidence is would a reasonable jury be able to hear this testimony, weigh this evidence, see the photographs, hear the experts, 
Are you right? You five minutes, but you can keep going. You can save it. What do you want to do? Well, if you do, if 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 none of the three of you have a current question, I'd like to save it. All right, we'll save it for you. <laughs> Hey, please record. Uh, my name is Carl Bober. I'm from Vernon and Bowling. I'm here on behalf of Citizens Property Insurance. Um, the case before you concerns a claim for damages allegedly due to a collapse of a steel balcony where there is not one witness in the record who testified that they actually witnessed or knew of any collapse or even a partial collapse of any portion of the appellant's property. Can I ask you a question? Yes, can a sudden collapse be proven by circumstantial evidence, or you need eyewitness testimony? It could be proven by a sudden collapse, uh, by a circumstantial testimony, Judge, but to your point, it actually wasn't a month till it was reported. It was two months uh, or, or greater. It was, but he just said no one made a big deal about that below. Uh, when you say big deal about it, the, the, what the judge made a big, the trial judge made a big deal about was the absence of evidence. Uh, and that was, as, as Judge Black, Judge, just Black, Judge Black indicated, there was just a lack of evidence, circumstantial or otherwise, that established an abrupt fall in the property. And contrary to what... Uh, did the judge actually say what you just said? He said there was an absence of evidence. Uh, he didn't make a, he didn't specifically comment on the two-month delay in the report. Um, and, and contrary to what uh, Judge uh, LaRose said, uh, we, I think the court said, we know that it fell. We don't know that it fell. The only testimony from any that the beam fell was incompetent uh, hearsay testimony. There was not a single sworn witness who testified that they know that it fell. What they know, what they knew, was that it was on the ground. And keep in mind, this is in the course of a renovation of a building that's being demoed and remodeled by contractors. So they've been in the process of remodeling, and some contractor says, well, th there's no competent witness who testified to ever seeing it even fall, let alone sudden or abruptly. Uh, there's no witness who testified what, 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 Remind me what the record shows about the pillars. So there is a stone facade, as counsel said. The pillars, the stone facade covers portions of the pillars that were upholding the uh, second floor balcony. Okay. Now, is there anything to suggest that these pillars were damaged as a result of the alleged collapse? There's, they were rusted, and they had been. What, what, what the re, part of the renovation was that there was damage, crack, visible cracks that were going on to this stone facade. So when we talk about hidden damage, the, the, the cracking to the facade was no, was visible according to the property manager. Right. Um, and in the midst of the renovation, the demo, and the remodeling, the contractors became concerned about the stability of this. They brought in an engineer all of which happened before citizens ever got there or even the claim was reported. And he said, you're gonna to need to take this stuff down. So in the context of a renovation where the stone is being replaced and repaired, the engineer has told the contractors, you're gonna to need to take down this rusted out beam. The notion that, well, a jury could, you, you can't draw a more likely than not inference from any of this because it's not like just a beam just suddenly fell, gosh, that doesn't happen every day. This is a building that's being demoed and remodeled according to contractors and engineers. And someone says, a hearsay person says, it fell, not you know, competent evidence. And that is the singular evidence that a fall occurred, let alone a sudden and abrupt one. We don't have any, we don't have the GC or the sub or whoever's working on the renovation project to testify, right? Um, the, the, no subs testified. That there, there, was, yeah, there, was no, there was no GC who testified about witnessing any fall whatsoever. So your suggestion is that this beam may have been just taken down in the process of renovation? My suggestion is that there's no evidence that it's po certainly possible. And for I mean, they were that was part of the plan. That was part of the intention of the renovation, according to the, what the engineer testified, that he said, this is going to need to come out. So it, you can't just reasonably infer, well, it must have fallen. Not necessarily. And there's no witness who set up, who actually testified that it it's in the context of a renovation where this is part of the intended part of the demo and renovation. So how is a, a jury supposed to say, I can infer that it must have fallen? Based on what? I mean, we have damaged, rusted 
corroded material that contractors are in the process of removing, and they're supposed to infer from that it must have fallen, let alone suddenly and abruptly. I mean, it's conjecture upon conjecture upon conjecture. There's not evidence of that. Um, and then there's no resulting damage to the pillars. No, I mean, they were just rusted and corroded. There was nothing, there was no, there was no evidence in the record that there was some damage to the pillars as a consequence of a fall, for example. Um, now, the policy has this limitation. So, so to begin, one, it's a failure of proof. That's really the biggest problem here. It's not about ambiguity in the policy. There is a complete wholesale failure of proof that there was a collapse at all, let alone one that was sudden and abrupt. And that was predominantly the trial court's finding, is I don't see how any jury could make such a determination that a collapse occurred. There's just a, a failure of proof. Um, and as, as, as Judge Volante commented, the policy comments, it requires an abrupt falling down or caving in of a building, um, and there's simply no record evidence to support that. Now, by the time citizens, by the time the claim was reported, nearly two months later, when citizens got out there a couple weeks after that, uh, at that point, a lot of the material had already been disposed of, uh, and including whatever supposedly fell. So they were able to see some things, a lot of it had already been removed. There was nothing that citizens could look at or its engineer could look at to determine if there was any basis for this whatsoever. Um, now he did observe and note that the, the, uh, the beams were severely corroded and rusted, and he believed that was a condition that had been going on for many years. Um, and hence why the... I understand. I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so... Uh, on the basis of the inspection of the materials that were presented to citizens, citizens found that, the, that this was due to corrosion and decay, which is not, and wear and tear, which is not covered under the policy. There was also some suggestion that the stone was probably improperly installed, that it either should have had flashing that prevented water from getting behind the stone that allowed the metal to rust, or there should have been space uh, uh, on the bottom for water to drip out. So there was also, that was also part of the denial under the exclusions contained within the policy. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as the, the, the public adjuster's testimony, is an issue, the public adjuster who reported, the, you know, was responsible for reporting the claim on behalf of the plant, said he was not aware of a collapse at the property. Uh, he then uh, did an errata sheet and said, well, I really haven't received any information or evidence that a collapse occurred, but I would defer to the engineer. Um, the engineer provided no testimony that a collapse uh, occurred. He only became involved after the contractor was already on the job doing the remodeling and the restoration work. He testified he had no knowledge of a collapse or anything falling off of the building, nor anything falling around the back porch at all. Uh, nor does he opine about any sudden or abrupt falling down uh, of the building on the record. There's one comment in the briefs about um, Possibly it could have been starting, but then and counsel relies upon that in his brief, but in that same page of testimony, uh, the expert says, but the stone was holding it up, so that was supporting it, but that was, wasn't stable, so that was going to have to be removed. So in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, there was the possibility of this, if this wasn't remedied, that these things could come down. But there's zero to, even according to the engineer, his testimony when he said it was starting, but then he said it was being supported by the stone uh, on that same page of testimony, and I didn't actually see anything falling off of the building or the area. So it was the, it, it, in its light most favorable to him, that he's discussing the possibility this could occur possibly sometime in the future if the problem was not remedied. Um, so, and, and interestingly, even in their amended complaint, the plaintiffs alleged no actual date of loss nor do they even allege in their complaint that a collapse occurred. It's not even pled in the complaint. The first time citizens learned of it was not during the inspection of this claim, but when they got answers to interrogatories in the middle of the discovery, when suddenly the collapse of theory was advanced for the very first time to citizens. <laughs> um, and finally, on the issue of uh, you know, plaintiff's reliance on King's Ridge, um, first, there's no question in King's Ridge there is a discrete event, as, as the court has noted, where the, there's downward deflection of the roof and the trusses and portions of the, uh, of the ceiling, and that's on a discrete day. 
There was no indication in that opinion that there was a, a failure of proof or a dispute over whether it did or didn't go down. So there was clearly a caving in or a displacement uh, on, a, on a discrete day that the parties could point to. Here we have a, a house that's undergoing an active renovation and remodeling. So there's, and no, why eyewitness testimony might not be essential in every case, but in this case where the house is actually being demoed, remodeled, and the portion of the property that's claimed to have been the, the subject of the collapse was part of what the demo was about. It was to remove that. And so in the absence of some testimony, that, no, 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 it, it fell. You know, the reasonable inference is it's part of the, de uh, the more reasonable inference, I would submit to the court, one could argue in the absence of any contrary testimony, the only inference is that it, it, it was part of the Merriam-Webster's and, and Kingsbridge says this, it's sudden and, and unanticipated. Uh, th this was wholly anticipated. In fact, the engineer said it needs to be removed because of all this cracking and the damage that's going on here. There's nothing abrupt about this condition whatsoever. Uh, it, it was fully known, it became known as part of a renovation and not some sudden and accidental occurrence which is what normally is contemplated under a first party property policy. And I take issue with the plaintiff's counsel's suggestion that you, you almost never have witnesses. I have witnesses all the time who see things. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. As the Judge Blante, Judge Blante noted, sometimes it's circumstantial. But here there is the only circumstantial evidence, evidence lends itself to one that it wasn't abrupt and there's not even evidence of a fall per se. Um, so with that, um, this doesn't turn on ambiguity in the policy. Uh, you know, this is just a failure of proof on the part of the plaintiff, unfortunately. And, um, you know, there was basis based on the, the corrosion and decay that was present on the property for citizen and the improper installation, about which, by the way, the experts largely agreed, um, you know, that this, this, this claim does not rise to the, uh, does not fall within the coverage of the policy. And the trial court correctly determined that there was an absence of evidence establishing a collapse as it's defined within the policy. And therefore, the summary judgment in favor of, the, of uh, citizens should be affirmed. Thank you. All right, Mr. Boggs, you've got five minutes. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. In the additional coverage collapse, there are six subsections of criteria. We had talked about two, which requires hidden decay. The sixth subsection is specifically when a collapse happens during renovation, during construction, which is our exact scenario. Now we have an engineer that's saying, my gosh, this, this beam is failing, right? And he sees it passing its structural load onto the facade instead of the original beams it was intended to. And then you have him expressing concern to the property manager, who's taking photographs, taking notes, being on the property, overseeing the project. Then you have the contractor that says to the property manager, this beam fell. Now they were in charge of removing the stone Council had said they were supposed to remove, they were supposed to remove the stone facade, not the beams. And then the property manager says, thank God no one was hurt. So it's, it's not that we have, there's this wholesale lack of evidence. We have people that were, are eyewitnesses to the conditions that existed and what took place during that renovation. Unless we had someone standing there that saw it fall, which uh, is very unusual. I mean, that's the kind of eyewitness testimony that seems to be inferred in the, in the courts, the lower court's order. And we just so rarely ever have that. It's, it's the, the bar is not eyewitness testimony, right? There's a lot of credible testimony that may not be by an eyewitness, especially in first party property damage work. So we are talking about a definition for collapse. And we will use collapse in a lot of different ways in language, don't we? We could talk about a psychological collapse. We could talk about a societal collapse. Well, you're two and a half minutes, so. 
Two year warning. <laughs> we may talk about an engineering collapse. King's Ridge is, allows us to interpret the collapse in the policy under additional coverage collapse as not having to be the whole building falls down. It doesn't have to be abrupt. It doesn't have to be something that is eyewitnessed. Here we have very special concerns by a professional engineer about the condition of this beam. He is are, you, a, are you saying that collapse over time qualifies as an abrupt collapse under the policy? I think in our situation where the collapse the condition of, of hidden decay, right, is a requirement. How are we to know? If, 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 if the decay causing the issues is hidden, we don't know until we know. And in this case, it wasn't until that stone facade was removed and that we were able to see, well, this decay has been going on because of the water intrusion between the exterior of the home and the facade itself. So with that, we will rest upon the further uh, consideration of our brief. Is there any other questions? By your honors. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day. Thank you. We have recess. All rise. Thank you. Travel safely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.